Hello and welcome to Assassination Witness. My name is Siria Gastelum Felix. In the next half an hour, we will be looking at how organized criminals around the world use murder as a tool to silence the brave individuals who stand up to them, from campaigners to journalists to politicians and more. We'll be hearing these stories, speaking to the people who are organizing the fight back, and also we'll be discussing how you can play a part in tackling this important issue by joining the Global Initiatives Assassination Witness Campaign. But first, the story of Maria Elena Ferraz, a Mexican journalist who was killed recently in the state of Veracruz, and her daughter, Fernanda de la Luna Ferral, also a journalist who just last May was attacked by gunmen and barely made it alive. Let's watch. El miedo de estar amenazada. He vivido con ese miedo durante toda mi vida porque mi mamá siempre recibía todo tipo de amenazas, así que el 30 de marzo, el día que atacan y atentan contra la vida de mi madre y posteriormente muere, yo estaba en mi casa, pasan dos horas y me meten a mí al quirófano con ella y me la veo como la están operando, veo la sangre y me dicen que, que no hay muchas posibilidades que la bala perforó, que una de las balas perforó los dos pulmones y que estaba perdiendo mucha sangre y que otra de las balas perforó el, el hígado. Era un daño catastrófico, no, no podía, no la podían recuperar. Ella sabía que tocaba muchos intereses, pero ella siempre decía que si no lo escribía ella, nadie lo iba a escribir. Batalló mucho para llegar a ser lo que fue. Era una mujer muy fuerte, de carácter muy fuerte pero también tenía un corazón enorme. Mis compañeros en todo el estado respondieron, se alzaron, se manifestaron, externaron sus críticas, su, su enojo. Ella tenía muchas, muchas cosas todavía que hacer. Como ciudadana, eso era lo que más quería, regresar a su pueblo, a su natal Gutiérrez Zamora, ser alcaldesa y hacer un gobierno diferente. El periodismo en Veracruz se ha vuelto complicado de ejercer, desde hace 20 años, las cifras de periodistas caídos en este estado han ido aumentando. Solamente quiero que este caso no sea olvidado, que no le den carpetazo. Yo quiero darle eso, justicia. Fernanda is currently in hiding and her life still under threat. That's why today, in the Global Initiative, we're launching the Assassination Witness Campaign to stamp out criminal organizations worldwide and to seek justice for victims across the globe. Joining me now is Mark Shaw, director of the Global Initiative. Welcome, Mark. And can you please tell us what is this whole campaign about? So many people are targeted by criminal groups, good people doing uh, community activism to respond to organized crime. And organized crime uses assassinations to control, uh, to, to use the violence to strike fear, to co-opt institutions. And as we cover in this book, which we are reducing faces of assassination, good people are dying, sometimes in the crossfire, sometimes as targets. And why are they targeted? Because they threaten criminal groups' activities, they throw light on their behavior. And in many places, in, in, in assassinations take on a symbolic aspect. Individuals are killed to demonstrate a wider reality, to frighten people off from responding to to organize crime in the control of, of criminal bosses. And it's working. People are too afraid to report. People are afraid to mobilize against organized crime. Journalists are afraid to investigate. Police are afraid to prosecute. So if we allow the problem just to escalate, and our own work shows how the problem occurs in clusters, as in the case of Mexico and the targeting of journalists, assassinations almost become an uncontrollable phenomenon in societies and we need to do something about it, to tell the individual stories and then to bring the individual stories together to illustrate the phenomenon and to use the phenomena and, uh, uh, and, and the individual stories combined together to be able to respond and respond effectively in a campaign. And that's what we intend to do with the work that we, are, uh, uh, that we have begun. And, and that's what we are telling you today, that this campaign is a resource for you to know more about this story. So please do go to our website, subscribe to our newsletter, use our hashtag assassination witness to help us remember these people.
because this cause is close to my heart. I lost colleague and friend Javier Valdez, an award-winning journalist from Mexico who campaigned against organized crime. Javier was murdered in 2017 in Culiacán, Sinaloa. Tragically, Javier's murder is just one of the hundreds of assassinations carried out every year across the world. Just last year, 304 human rights activists were assassinated, with over 100 in Colombia alone. In 2018, more than three people were murdered each and every week for defending land and advocating for the environment. In the last 20 years, 625 journalists have been murdered for their reporting and investigations on crime and corruption. These were targeted killings across every continent. Extraordinary men and women all over the world making the ultimate sacrifice in standing up to organized crime, paying for their lives in fights for human rights, for the environment, to end violence, corruption, and to highlight the plight of the marginalized and targeted in their communities. This is certainly an issue that covers every continent and a wide range of actors. So joining us now is Annie Kamala. She's a United Nations Special Envoy, a human rights lawyer, and an outspoken, brave investigator into judicial killings like the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi and other gross human rights violations. She herself has received many death threats. So Anis, welcome. It's a total honor to have you here. Can you please tell us more about the nature of the killings that we are talking about in this campaign and why, if this happens at such a scale, there's not more uh, coordinated response? I would like uh, to um, to uh, highlight how important the report is and how important the work is. As uh, a special rapporteur on extrajudicial execution, most of my work tend to focus on killings uh, planned and organized and perpetrated by the state. However, I am fully aware that for a very large number of people around the world, organized criminal gangs, uh, cartels, mafia are the main source of violence and the main source of killings. So it is extremely important that um, this uh, book be launched today and that assassination witness put the spotlight on organized criminal gangs. Why is it important? A, because I think in the human rights world, those killings tend to be neglected unless they have a strong state dimension. And it is important that as human rights activists, human rights defenders, we take the stand of the victims, whether they are killed by the state or by those organized criminal organizations which have so much control in places around the world over territories and people. These criminal gangs operate in collusion with officials. They operate as part of a political system which either um, turn a blind eyes to their activities or indeed is part of their activities. Those kind of assassination allows us to highlight the poison that eats at our societies, that is driven by corrupt politicians, by corrupt corporations, and uh, implemented by the organized criminal gangs. That's why we continue and must continue to denounce those killings with the same um, uh, force and strength that we denounce killings by state actors. Thank you, Annie. It's certainly it's a complex phenomenon, but it is also a conversation that we must take part of if we want to see any change. And now I want to tell you about one of the highest profile cases in these assassinations. I'm talking about the journalist and anti-corruption activist Daphne Caruana Galizia. Daphne was murdered by a car bomb in Malta in 2007. After her reporting on government corruption, nepotism and money laundering became too powerful for criminal gangs to tolerate. Thousands attended her funeral and the public outrage eventually helped topple the government in Malta. We're joined now by Andrew Caruana Galicia, Daphne's son, who will speak to us about the fight of his family to find justice for Daphne. Welcome, Andrew. Tell us more about your mother. What was she like? The causes that she fought for 
and that eventually she sacrificed her life for. One of the biggest challenges me and my my family faced when when my mother was assassinated is describing just how important her role in society was. There are a few examples from around the world of of a journalist who took on such an important role in in a country's democracy. So she she started out as a political commentator with an opinion column twice a week in the main national newspaper, but as as the corruption on the way in, in the national government in Malta became impossible to ignore, she became more of an investigative journalist than a columnist. And so she developed this incredible network of sources, including in investigative authorities in the country. And she covered stories that most, um, or rather all journalists in the country were either too afraid to cover, didn't have the right connections to cover, or didn't have editorial support to cover. And because she had launched her own website at a certain point, she had complete editorial freedom. She didn't have a lawyer breathing down her neck telling her, look, this is libelous. So it meant that she could, she could often, um, she was like the tip of the spear in Maltese journalism. But it also meant she was exposed to, to a lot of blowback from, from politicians, from organized criminals. And uh, at the time of her assassination, she was facing 47 libel suits in, in court, including several criminal libel suits brought by, by cabinet ministers. Andrew, Fernanda told me that she knew her mother's life was under threat when she was only six years old. Do you think that Daphne knew that her life was in danger? Her priorities were always in a very unique order. First, pursuing truth, being true to herself, um, her own sort of personal morality, and then second, everything else that everyone normally cares about. So from a really young age, we're talking her early mid-20s, she, she started pursuing some of the country's most prominent drug traffickers, some of the most corrupt ministers, including the ecosystem that supported them. What does this mean? It means the lawyers, their accountants. She delved into some of the worst parts of Maltese history. So she was one of the only people who was still talking about certain unexplained deaths that occurred in the 1980s in Malta. I remember coming home from school once when I was maybe six or seven years old and finding our, our family dog lying on our doorstep with its throat slit. And, and I remember my mother telling me and my brothers, oh, she must have eaten snail poison. There's a strange impact when you survive something like that as a family. It emboldens you because no one was badly hurt. No one died. It, you know, it emboldened my mother. It emboldened all of us to support her. And so she, you know, she grew more dedicated in her work. Definitely the story of Daphne is really moving her courage, her resolution to continue investigating despite the fear. Next. I want to show you the stories of many brave men and women who, despite the attacks and despite the fears, continue their work. They were not silenced, but they all ended up murdered. I wish to express that the order was given to execute me. It was ordered. If I die, I request that a human rights organization investigate. Living is dangerous. Working as a journalist means treading an invisible line drawn by the bad guys from both the drug cartels and the government, a sharp floor covered with explosives. I am not afraid of death. I am more afraid to live as a coward than to die as a man. What is the point of a law if activists can be framed, jailed, killed for it? I am wearing bulletproof. I know these people are waiting for me and want to kill me anytime. Don't allow them to take you. Make sure your bones can be found by your family. If you get me assassinated, you think that I'm not afraid of. There will always be people who will demand that you render account for your deeds. Berta taught us that fear paralyzes action of the people. We will never give up, even if we get killed even if they murder us. Many of the people that were profiling in the campaigns knew their lives were under threat, but there were no resources to protect them. 
what do you think is going wrong here? Well, many things are going are going wrong, but uh, the, the key uh, dimension is the uh, institutionalization of impunity and the uh, demonstration of the uh, inability or the unwillingness of governments to uh, investigate and prosecute. I know some of the cases that have been portrayed in this uh, movie and in, in your book. Um, I have gone to places, including in Mexico, where uh, four or five years after the killing of a journalist by so-called organized gang, the investigation file was one or two page long. So the problem begins here. The problem begins with the fact that the police in many places, either because they are corrupt or because they are scared, are not investigating the case. Witnesses are not interviewed and material evidence is not co collected, which means that when a case goes to trial, if it goes to trial, there is nothing sufficient there to prosecute. And it doesn't ask too much of our international community to, to stand up to those assassination. The most important thing that people can do is speak up and speak out against those murders. You know, you, you, you had the fantastic example of uh, uh, Daphne's uh, family. Without them and without civil society supporting them, the case will have gone nowhere, nowhere. Speaking up works. It requires a lot of energy and it shouldn't, but we need to speak up and we need to push for those investigations because when they are successful, they demonstrate and they get rid of the poison that is eating at our society in the same way that Daphne's investigation has highlighted the poison eating at the political and corporate society of Malta. This is what we this is why we need to stand up and this is why we need to call for proper investigation for the UN to do far more than they are doing at the moment by establishing the standing instrument to investigate the killings, the assassinations of defenders and journalists around the world. Thank you, Anit. And yes, we need to speak up. So many people are dying with impunity and no response, not, not a response that's good enough to save their lives and to prevent more people dying. So that's why in the global initiative, we are bringing this assassination witness campaign for you to speak up, to join our website, to subscribe to our newsletter, to tell us about the stories in your communities, because it is also time to talk about the solutions. Mark, let's talk about what needs to be done here. What do you think we should be doing? So as both you and Anias have said, this is fundamentally about a campaign to prevent silencing. The, uh, the objective of criminal groups in targeting uh, the individuals in the book and many more uh, that we know about is to silence people. And in fact, what we want to do uh, under the auspices of the campaign is to do exactly the opposite, to create an outcry, to mobilize uh, both locally, given that, that many murders occur in very local contexts, they don't make the international news, and to mobilize and to achieve change uh, based on, on the tragedies that are, have occurred. Take the case of, of Wayne Lotter, a country man of mine, who was investigating uh, illicit wildlife trafficking in, in East Africa. And he was targeted by a combination of, of individuals, both within the state and within trafficking syndicates. And it just shows how the activity of, of, of uh, such organizations is aimed at, at bringing silence. And we need to act against that. Thank you, Mark. In fact, uh, a few days back, we spoke to Chrissy Clark. She co-founded with Wayne Lauter the PAMS Foundation to protect wildlife. Wayne Lauter was assassinated in Dar es Salaam in 2017. My name is Chrissy Clark. I'm the co-founder of PAMS Foundation. I was fortunate enough to found uh, PAMS Foundation together with Wayne Lauter, who turned the tide of poaching in Tanzania, which was a country that people said was a lost case. Nobody could succeed there, and, and he did. Everyone that he touched, he showed them never to give up and to always be determined in all, in all that you do. Wayne was an incredible person. At a young age, from what I understand, he already had a love for animals and so really just wanted to do everything he could possibly to help wildlife and wild places. Just, you know, a man of integrity. Throughout our work, we encountered many hurdles and he was always determined and motivated. Let's keep going and not give up and let's try this way, let's try that way. 
you know, he was a strategist thinking out the box and not scared to try different things. Let's try this unit. Let's see if we can do it. Let's convince a donor to fund it. And, and that's where Wayne was amazing. Wayne did know that it was dangerous and you did feel it and you needed to be careful, but we didn't know at the time to what extent how dangerous it was. While we were traveling in our taxis when we got attacked, I was fortunate to escape, but sadly Wayne didn't make it. That was a huge shock to us and, and I think also to the world. We, the world had lost an incredible man. After Wayne's death, I wasn't sure whether our staff would want to carry on working for Pam's foundation, you know, because of what, what had just happened to us, because obviously we now understand the risks that we're involved in. And once I spoke to the staff and asked them if they would like to go work somewhere else and I can try to help them find another job, it was incredible because none of them wanted to change. They all said, no way. So we're here, we're even more determined. We need to continue his legacy. But we as an organization as a whole have tried to continue doing everything we did and the same philosophies and the same determination as, as he has. It was an incredible honor to be able to work with him and have him as a mentor for 10 years in my life. And we miss him sadly, incredibly much now. Chrissy was a close friend to Lauter and she continues his work like Fernanda is continuing the work of her mother. Now, Andrew, you and your brothers have been very active and very vocal championing your mother's cause. Tell us what is it like to carry the legacy of Daphne Caruana Galizia? We were always proud of our mother, but you know, now, now it's not just us. You know, there are um, there are so many thousands of people who are proud of what she's done, who are who are proud to have been a reader of hers, who are proud to have supported her in the past, who are proud to carry forward her legacy now. Um, but of course, it's, I mean, we were talking about how important it is for families to speak out after an assassination, but it's, it's so, so difficult. And so we realized that us speaking out gave courage to other people. And now we've reached a stage where, you know, there are there are many thousands of people who've taken up the cause. It's not just me and my family alone. That would have been completely unsustainable. But if we had remained silent in, in the first weeks, um, then that momentum would have never built up. Then the assassination would have been successful at at imposing the silence on, on our entire society. So it really falls to the family to break that silence. And for that, you do need the hope that other people will join you in speaking up. And it's certainly not easy to continue the fight with the pain, with the fear. But there are many communities where, in fact, people get together and protest and continue the causes that led to these targeted killings. In fact, they bring more attention to the causes at stake after all these people are protesting. Under your family's campaign to get justice for your mother, topple ahead of government. And this is inspiring and it shows what communities can do when they're in power and they take a stand against corrupt politicians and, and bad institutions. But this sounds very inspiring, but how did you achieve this? This is an example that proves that mobilization does have an impact on even the most hardened criminals and that it's, it's absolutely essential to maintain the courage of people who are moving things forward in, in the criminal justice system. That means police investigators, judges, all the people who work for them, because the price of doing this work is enormous while powerful criminals remain free and they need to feel they're doing it for someone. The price is high, as you said, but your story definitely gives us hope. And if you want to know more about the story of Daphne Caruana Galizia, go to our website, download our book, where you can read about the stories of many journalists, activists, environmentalists who have stood up against organized crime. Join our assassination witness campaign, subscribe to our newsletter, and use our hashtag to know more and be part of this conversation. As Andrew has mentioned, this is an international issue. And as Mark said, a lot of these crimes go unnoticed. So Agnes, what do you think we should be doing at the international level? There is a special rapporteur who's done uh, a number of reports in relation to Malta and the killing of, of Daphne. The European Parliament uh, has issued a resolution and supported the family and civil society and it is this combined international pressure 
bringing together the family, the civil society, the international actors, the multilateral organizations, um, international human rights experts. It is that combination of actors that is also helping in breaking the silence and in particular breaking the attempt by the organized criminal uh, gangs with the collusion of politicians and corporate actors. Those are come together attempting to silence us or attempting to uh, make us feel that there is nothing we can do. Uh, so that is why the uh, UN the international organization, the regional organizations, whether it's in Europe, in Latin America, or in Africa, they must do everything. And uh, denouncing is good, speaking up is good. Now we need to move to the next level. Thank you, Anis. And listening to what you have just said, what Andrew has said about people coming together and what Mark has explained to us that this campaign is trying to achieve by remembering the death anniversaries by making these profiles public, is that we do need greater mobilization at the local and at the international level. Mark, can you tell us how does the assassination witness campaign fits in all this? Thanks, sir. Really, we are focusing on, on three things that all of the people have covered in different ways in their contribution today. The first, is to put the issue out there in the spotlight. So to count the cases, to record them, to understand what's going on, their sheer volume of what is occurring in a very complex political economy and, and political space. Secondly, is to tell the individual stories so that people's contribution, their courage, their bravery in a variety of campaigns at local, at regional, at national level is not forgotten. And by telling their stories to remember uh, their contribution to, to the discussion. Thirdly, to mobilize and to mobilize with partners at all levels, not only civil society, we are a network focused on organized crime, but with a range of, of other actors uh, within the space to, to respond. We've begun with this book to profile 50 cases. As you know, there are many more, but across the spectrum, across the globe, illustrating the nature of the phenomenon. We will continue uh, to do that. Secondly, we will mark the anniversaries consecutive, uh, systematically of people who have been killed by organized crime, good people responding uh, to the challenge of, of criminal governance, the linkage to corporate actors, the linkage to the state, as Inez has said. Uh, we will mem uh, remember on the anniversaries of their deaths. And finally, we will join forces with others. Uh, Andrew has mentioned his family, his foundation, the role that they are playing. Inez has mentioned her own role. There are many actors eager to respond, from families to civil society groups uh, uh, to other bodies. And as in our, in our own way as a global network, which is analyzing organized crime, we think that we can play a role through this campaign uh, in taking action in this way. And this has much wider implications. It has implications for governance at local level. It has implications for, uh, the, for inequality and the conducting of, uh, uh, of economies that benefit all. And it has real implications for corruption uh, and violence uh, in political systems. So make no mistake, this is a, an enormous issue uh, which we as a global community and as civil society actors uh, need to pay attention to and need to act against. Thank you, Mark. That was really powerful. So let's get to work by joining the Assassination Witness Campaign. And if the stories you heard today were moving to you, remember you can do something about it. So please go to our website, subscribe to our newsletter, help us remember the death anniversaries, use our hashtag assassination witness. The best tribute you can pay to the courageous people who stood up to crime is to keep their memories alive. And with our collective memory, shine a light into this darkness. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>